praise God, praise God. Let the people of God say amen, amen. I welcome you to the Bread Broadcast, a Bible teaching program where we edify, we exalt, and we challenge believers to the Great Commission. Here, we also call sinners to salvation through the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining us. Today, we are going to be talking about the seed and the soil. The seed and the soil. And our case study is going to be the parable of the soil as told by our Lord Jesus Christ. And the short reading for that is the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 13. Verse 3, we stop at verse 9. Matthew chapter 13, verse 3, we start at 9. Let us pray. Father, thank you. Oh, Father, through our Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, we honor you. Dear blessed Redeemer Lord Jesus, hallowed be your holy name. Sweet, blessed Holy Spirit, we honor you. God in three persons, blessed Trinity, we have you, the exalted Lord, for there is none like you. Thank you for all you are, thank you for all you are, and thank you for all you are to us. Lord, we ask that you take this lesson and use it for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, teach through me. Let it be you, O oh Lord, that will speak to these people and not me. In Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Our foundation text is the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 7, verse 21, Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. That's straight from the Lord's mouth himself. So what can we learn from the seed and the soul? Now, anytime the Bible uses the word seed, it's always talking about the word of God. It's not money. No. Some people have they've taken that off and they'll say plant your seed. No. The seed, according to the gospel, is the word of God. So let's get that straight. And the soil is the heart of man, or the heart of the woman. Your heart, my heart, that is the soil. So what can we learn from this parable? Parables are, are a way of our Lord teaching spiritual truth using everyday imageries or common things that people were used to to bring out spiritual truth. And the Lord, if you read the short reading, so I'm not going to, to go over that parable because I want you to go read it. Uh, but there are four categories of soils or hearts that the Lord spoke about. So the first uh, group, uh, they are the wayside dwellers. Now, the Lord said the seed fell on the wayside. So I coined that language, I call them the wayside dwellers or the rebellious. This group shows the natural state of man. When I say man, I'm talking about mankind, human beings. We were all born with a rebellious heart. Naturally, we are children of rebellion because that had been passed down through Adam's blood to every one of us. Nobody was born uh, a Christian, a believer. No. 
But as time goes on, the Lord gives every one of us the opportunity to hear the gospel and the opportunity to make a choice, okay? So this group, the wayside dwellers, they show the natural state of the heart of man. Individuals in this group have had access to the gospel. Please listen closely, especially if you're a believer and you, you, you mentor people or you, you teach people. The people in this group, the wayside people, they have had the opportunity, the access to the gospel. They comprehended the gospel. They are not mentally challenged. They know right from wrong. But, listen up, they have chosen to tune out the word of God, you see. They do not want to surrender to the Lord. The representative of this group will be the Jews in the time of the Lord. The Jews of Jesus' time considered that Christ had done all things well, according to Mark 7.37. And they also agreed that the Lord Jesus had committed no sin, according to John 8.46. They said it with their own mouth. Yet, they contended with the Lord because he said he was God in John 10, 33. They would rather choose who ruled them. That was their problem, than voluntarily surrender to live under God's rule. This same group would later declare Caesar as their king. Can you believe that? In John 19, 15. So they wanted their own kind of king. They will, if, if, the money want, if they want money to be their king, money will be their king. If self, uh, if they want self to be their king, self will be their king. So the people by the wayside, the wayside dwellers, they choose their own king. This rebellious group hates the Lord. Because the word of God never entered their heart by choice. You see. Let's go to Acts 24-25. And this is a very classic example. Acts 24-25. This is uh, Felix, the Roman uh, governor in Caesarea when Apostle Paul was brought to his presence. And Apostle Paul began to preach in his presence. Uh, now as he reasoned, that is, as Apostle Paul reasoned about righteousness, he was preaching to him about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Felix was afraid and answered, go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you, you see. He was afraid because he understood what Apostle Paul was saying. When he started talking about righteousness, about judgment to come, and he became uncomfortable. And he said, go away from that. Go away. The sh people in this group, they shoo the preachers away. They shoo the children of God away. They shoo the Bible. They don't want to hear the name Jesus Christ. No, they, they're like, no, 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 don't, don't, just go. By choice. Your life is on hold when you put God on hold. Listen up. If you are one of those people that you don't want to hear anything about the gospel, I don't want to have anything to do with God, uh, please don't preach to me. If you are one of those, you may be wonderful to yourself. Listen up. You need God. If you don't agree now, God forbid, if you should die in that state and go to hell, you will know you need God then. But I'm, I'm telling you, you need God even right now. So if you have been putting God on hold, you have been putting your life on hold. Your life is on hold when you put God on hold. Moving on. The stones dwellers. I call them the replicas. This group shows the superficial state of mind. They join in 
in doing what others are doing without any deep thought about its ramifications or any personal conviction whatsoever. They are very shy. This group of people live a bandwagon life. A representative of this group will be Simon the sorcerer in the book of Acts chapter 8 verse 9 to 13. Simon the sorcerer, he saw everybody in Samaria giving their lives to Jesus Christ when Philip preached in the, in the city of Samaria. So the Bible says, Simon also believed, you see, and was even baptized. However, watch this. His heart was exposed when he asked Peter to send the Holy Spirit to him so he also could be performing miracles. When he saw the apostles that they were laying hands on people and people were receiving the Holy Spirit, guess what? He wanted to do that again, you see. He was everywhere. He saw people giving their lives to Jesus. He gave his life, quote of, and unquote. Then he saw the apostles uh, doing miracles by the power of the Holy Spirit. He wanted him to, he wanted him to you see. He was everywhere with everybody, without any deep thoughts. Simon's faith, if you can call it that, for the lack of better word, was superficial. It had no depth. Why it was thought that he became a believer and was even baptized, the Holy Spirit exposed him as not being a true believer. Because Apostle Peter, by the Holy Spirit, said that Simon had no part, no portion in this matter. What matter? In the case of the Holy Spirit. Because his heart was not right, you see. And the Bible says, uh, if, you don't belong, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you do not belong to Christ. So Apostle Peter by the Holy Spirit said, your heart is not right. You have no part or portion in this matter. In other words, you are not born again, Simon, even though you have been baptized, you see. The replicas are attracted by other people's reactions to the gospel and do not want to be left out. However, they were never impacted personally and internally by the gospel. This group is never born again. So you can see the difference. When some people start going to church or going to Bible study, like every time and you, you think, oh, it's, it's He's become a Christian or she's become a Christian. And all of a sudden, something happens, some pleasures or some persecutions, they've flown out. And you're going, what's going on? Did he lose his faith? He never had it, you see. He belonged to the group of Simon the Sorcerer. He's a replica, or she's a replica. John 9, 22, we stop at 23. John chapter 9, verse 22 and following. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that Christ, he was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, he is of age, ask him. This is the story of my wonderful brother, the blind brother, in John chapter 9. And after the Lord healed him and he received his sight, they said, what do you think of this man that healed your, your, your sight? He said, he's a prophet. How could he have done this if God was not with him? Well, cut a long story short. Uh, they, they called the parents, but the parents, they, they were scared of being pushed out of the synagogue, as I've just read. And they said, well, our son is of age. Ask him. They called him again, and he declared that Jesus is Christ, is the Messiah. Their son was kicked out of the synagogue, but the parents were not because they wanted to be part of the synagogue. So that brother apparently is in heaven today, praise God. I hope his parents, I hope they, they, they repented, but the Bible never told us that. So if eventually they did not, they are in hell, you see. So they were uh, part of the bandwagon. And because of that, they denied Christ. 
Thy brother in the matter of salvation is bad portion in the matter of destination. Listen up, please. When I say destination, I am talking eternal destination, heaven or hell. I am going to say that bread of the go slowly so you can get it. Bandwagon in the matter of salvation is bad portion in the matter of destination. To go to heaven or hell is personal. It has nothing to do with your parents. It has nothing to do with your wife or your husband. It's personal. So take your eternal destiny seriously. Surrender your heart to the Lord Jesus. Declare him as your Lord and tell him you want to surrender everything to him. Don't look at other people because you don't group uh, you don't go as a group to heaven or to hell. No, it's individual. Moving on. The thorns dwellers. Also, I call them the rat racers. This group shows the ambitious state of mind. People in this group not only understand the deep implications of salvation, they are even convicted of their sin and their need of the Savior. Track with me slowly, please. They show a sober living for a while, you see, according to our Lord's parable, because the Lord said they began to germinate. The, the seed that fell among the thorns, they began to germinate, you see, because the gospel had such a great impression on their heart. Nevertheless, listen up, people. Nevertheless, their ambition to achieve one thing or the other before committing fully to the things of God destroy the effect of the gospel in their hearts. And I've seen people like that. You will tell them about the salvation and uh, about, about the Lord Jesus Christ. And they will concur. They will not argue with you. They, they, they know they are sinners. Now commit yourself to the Lord and just say, accept me. I'm ready to follow you. And they will say, okay, I, I, I'll do that. I'll, just let me finish building my house. Or let me finish my uh, college. And, I'll, and before you know it, the effect will wear off over time and bam they are back to their madness you see with time they go back to their old vomit of sinful lifestyle people in this group were never impacted by the gospel they were only impressed by it king here is an example of the people in this group he was sober after being confronted by Elijah after he killed uh, Naboth because of his vineyard. However, after that, he threw another prophet, Micaiah, into prison for telling him the truth. You see, his, his repentance only lasted for so long. Unfortunately, this group is not born again because God's word never produced the intended result in their heart. The end result that God is looking for in every heart is that the heart be changed to receive a new heart from heaven and the Holy Spirit comes into that heart. If that is not achieved, then the gospel has not succeeded in the life of that person. It's not because you lived soberly for six months or for six years. No. The gospel is successful in your heart when you receive a new heart from heaven and the Holy Spirit comes into your heart. Then you are saved. If you are not yet at that level, listen, you may be a pastor or archbishop or pope or whatever title you like to go by, you are not saved. 
But that can change. Let's go to 1 Kings 21 verse 29. 1 Kings chapter 21 verse 29. This is God speaking to prophet Elijah. See how he has humbled himself before me. Because he has humbled himself before me. I will not bring the calamity in his days. In the days of his son, I will bring the calamity on his house, you see. Hell was so sober that God even recognized his, his soberness. But it didn't last. And Hell died a wicked king. He died in his iniquities. And he's now in hell, you see. So that somebody is sober for like three years or six months doesn't mean they are saved. No. They run after wings that fly, who run after things that dry. Listen, money dries up. If the stock market goes up and down, the money you are, you, you are chasing or the one you already have in your bank account can fly out just like that. Houses, they come and go. Clothing, whatever material things, even families. If you don't leave them, they leave you. You see, but about three or four weeks ago, my brother went to heaven. He left me here, you see. So all these things, they dry up. But salvation is the only thing that you will take from here that will take you to eternity. It never dries up. They run after wings that fly, who run after things that dry. You better stop running after stuff and start chasing the Lord. Amen. Now we come to the good news. The last group is the good ground dwellers. These people are tagged the reformed group. This group exemplifies the spiritual state of man where a new heart has been planted by God into an individual having received forgiveness of sin when they confess their sin and ask the Lord Jesus to save them. This group acknowledges and agrees with that verdict of their depravity and spiritual bankruptcy and their need for the Savior, Lord Jesus. It does not mean, please listen to this carefully, it does not mean just because the Lord called them the seed on the good ground, it doesn't mean this good ground does not have its own stones and thorns. But despite the hindrances, their commitment to the Lord and their desire for Christ and spiritual things have made them overcomers to become fruitful for the Lord, you see. I was sharing with my husband. I grew up in, in a neighborhood where people gossiped a lot because there were so many old people around, around me. And what I thought was like uh, passing comments, the Holy Spirit said, that's gossiping. I was shocked, you see. And I was like, Father, I need your help. Just help me. When people walk around or they do something, it's none of my business. I don't need to pass any comment, you see. So that's a thorn, but God is helping me, you see. Some people, there has maybe anger or whatever, but because their desire, our desire is for the Lord and to be like Christ, against our Lord, when the Holy Spirit tells us this is wrong, we will say, okay, Lord, help me, and we are willing and ready to surrender that area for the Lord. And in no time, the Holy Spirit will help us and we become more like Christ Jesus, you see. So just because the Lord said they are good grants doesn't mean they don't have any challenges. They do. But their, their commitment to the Lord has made them to be obedient to the dictate of the Holy Spirit. Let's see some examples. 
Abraham in the Bible, Abraham, before he became Abraham, he had to overcome his devil worship background by obeying the Lord and he left his country of birth so he could become fruitful for the Lord. Ruth had to uh, separate herself from her family and also her country of birth to be joined together with Naomi before she could be a good grand, you see. Peter had to overcome his impulsive behavior, cursing people out and cutting people's uh, ears off, you see. He had to overcome that in the power of the Holy Spirit. He kept surrendering himself to the leading of the Holy Spirit until he became a gentleman, indeed. And also, his racial bigotry. He had to keep uh, surrendering to the Holy Spirit until he overcame that to become a fruitful ground for the Lord. Lazarus, the beggar, the Bible says he was a poor man. He didn't allow his poverty to stop him from being saved, you see. Joseph of Arimathea, the Bible declares that he was, he, he was a very rich man and very influential. He didn't, he didn't allow his wealth to stand between him and salvation, you see. He had to overcome that power of wealth and riches and influence. And he humbled himself to, to, to become a fruitful ground for the Lord, you see. And Apostle Paul, time will fail me to start talking about this wonderful man of God. He had to overcome his fanatical religious background and submitted himself to the Holy Spirit to become a fruitful ground, the apostle to the Gentiles, you see. So we have all these kind of examples in the Bible and even now in the world. A lot of people, they used to be prostitutes. Uh, I, I once shared the story of a brother who was a bank robber. He went to, to, to prison for, for, for some time and he, he later became a child of God, you see. So every one of these people in this group, even though they are good grants, they had stuff that they had to overcome to become fruitful. But they were faithful and they desired Christ more than anything. And that's what made them fruitful for the Lord. That's why the gospel had the, the success in their hearts. Why fruitfulness at this level varies based on individual's motives and faithfulness to the Lord and the things of God. Overall, this group is impacted by the gospel enough to be reformed by it for their lifetime. You see, John chapter 9, verse 8, gospel according to St. John chapter 9, verse 8, therefore the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, is not this he who sat and begged? Until your Christianity makes your neighbors and your relatives to say, is this not the same Josephine Zion that I used to know 20 years ago? What happened? Until your Christianity gets to that level, you are not yet reformed. All right? Christ's offer will alter your life for good. Christ's offer for salvation will alter your life for good. If your Christianity has not altered your life to reform you, you are yet to be born again. So, what have we done so far? What can we learn from the parable of the seed and the soul? Number one, the wayside dwellers of the rebellious. They love self-rule and detest God's rule. The stones dwellers and the replicas, they profess faith based on the external reaction. The found dwellers or the rat racers, they miss out on salvation because of their love to chase after things. The good grand dwellers or the reformed, they fully commit to the Lord and so impacted that their lives become radically changed forever. 
Now, watch me. If you're a genuine believer, you can only belong to the Reformed group. That's it, according to the Word of God. You can only belong to the group good ground. That's it. However, fruitfulness in this group varies, like I said about two minutes ago. How, fru how fruitful are you to the Lord and to the gospel? How fruitful? Your fruitfulness is directly linked to your faithfulness. And you will be rewarded for your faithfulness. All right? Now listen up, please. If you go to church, you've been baptized, you are in the choir, you are the preacher in your church or your Bible fellowship, you are the women's leader or the men's leader, but you do not live a holy and reformed life. You are a baptized pagan. Say what? Say the Bible. You are a baptized pagan. A baptized pagan, come on close. We end up in hell, hellfire. Just like other workers of iniquities. But you can change that. Oh yeah, you can. If you are a non-believer, you belong to one of the first three groups. You are either a wayside dweller or a stone dweller or a thorns dwell. Any of these groups can only take you to one place, the lake of fire. That's it. That's all you are looking at. But you can change that too. That can change for you. If you are a baptized pagan or a stark pagan and you want to change, a change of direction in life and to eternity. A link is coming up. Follow that link. I only have so much time on this program. And we will meet you on that link. Alright? Father, we thank you. Oh Lord, help us to meditate on what you have told us. And let your word challenge us as believers to preach the gospel with urgency. And for those who are going to want to know Jesus' faith, Father, I pray that by the Holy Spirit, you will let them understand the plan of salvation. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I will see you next week. Only if Jesus has not split the sky open.